Hey there, welcome to the second presentation in Module 5. Um, today, uh, with this presentation, what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to introduce you uh, to what routing is and the need for routing and uh, some of the different methods that we have for doing uh, routing in IP network. So we're going to start out with uh, trunks on routers. Now, trunks are a concept that we've talked about on switches, where each v or multiple VLANs can be passed over a single Ethernet link. And the way we distinguish between those VLANs is using VLAN tags. Now, routers obviously can you can't just issue a switch port mode trunk command uh, because we don't configure VLANs on routers. Each uh, interface has a separate IP address. So what we have to do is we have to create what are called sub interfaces. Um, again, because we need the routers consider each interface a separate network, each interface is considered a separate broadcast domain, each interface is considered a separate VLAN, and so if we want to do more than one VLAN on one uh, interface, one more than one broadcast domain, we need to use sub-interfaces. And so I've given an example of that here. Um, you'll want to configure the overall interface, uh, in this case we're using Fast Ethernet 00, as whatever your native VLAN is. Uh, and by default on Cisco systems, uh, the native VLAN is VLAN 1. The untagged VLAN is VLAN 1. And so you're going to use Fast Ethernet 00 for your untagged traffic. In this case, I've given an IP address of 192.168.1.1 with a slash 24 subnet mask. And if we look at, uh, let's say we wanted to also pass VLAN 3 over that interface. And I've given a description for it so you can see exactly what this is. And I've given it, you'll notice it's a different subnet. It's in a different network, actually, altogether. And to distinguish it from the fast Ethernet 0 slash 0 traffic, I've given the command down there encapsulation.1q3. And that 3 specifies what VLAN uh, is specified by the subinterface. Now, the encapsulation.1q3 and the interface fast Ethernet 0 slash 0 dot 3, the 3 and the 3 there, um, actually don't have to have any correlation. Uh, you create sub-interfaces at will, and so you may pick 0 0.1 as your first sub-interface, and you could say encapsulation.1q3, that would still place it in VLAN 3. So now I want to take some time to talk about uh, routing and routing protocols and kind of what we're doing here. So the whole point of routing um, in general is we want to go from one network, one broadcast domain, to another. And so routers have a lot of different ways of doing this and a lot of different ways of learning about different broadcast domains that it may not be directly connected to. Um, and so we'll talk about those over the course of the next few weeks. Um, but the big ideas I kind of wanted to present with routing are right here. Um, the first one is that uh, in certain situations, a router may have more than one route to a destination that applies. Uh, for example, a route uh, given a destination of 10.1.1.1 slash 24. Um, let's suppose that there is a router, a, a route in its routing table for the network 10.0.0.0 slash 8, and another route for the network 10.1.1.0, or pardon me, 10, yes, 10.1.1.0 slash 24. So there are two routes. One is to the slash 8 network, that's the 10 network, and the other one is to the network 10.1.1. In this sort of a scenario, if traffic is received destined to 10.1.1.1, the more specific route, that is the route with the longest sub applicable subnet mask, will be taken. So if there are multiple routes to a destination, the route with the longest applicable subnet mask, the most specific route, will be taken. And if there's more than one identical route, so if they have identical subnet masks, the route with the lowest administrative distance will be installed in the routing table and the other route will be suppressed. Um, and this administrative distance is used to distinguish routes coming from different routing protocols or routes added by the user. Um, so as the administrative distance is set by based on the routing protocol or set by you. And we'll talk more about administrative distance as we go through these various routing protocols. After administrative distance, each routing protocol has an, its own mechanism to determine uh, the cost to a destination. Um, and I'll give you some quick examples. With RIP, which we'll be talking about next time, uh, it uses basically a hop count. So based on the number of routers that uh, the traffic has to pass through, um, it will try to minimize the number of hops, the number of router-to-router -router connections um, in the network. And so that's how RIP works. Whereas uh, EIGRP uses actually a combination of delay and bandwidth to determine what the lowest cost is. And each, each uh, different routing protocol has a different uh, way to determine this cost of the destination. I call it metric in most cases. 
So the first type of route we're going to talk about are directly connected routes. And these are the simplest type because um, as you configure your router interfaces and add IP addresses, each subnet that you configure is actually added to the router's routing table. And it makes sense because routers obviously know about the routes that, about the networks that they are directly connected to. Um, and you can actually view this routing table with the command show IP route. We're going to be using that command a lot in the coming weeks as we talk about different routing protocols. And directly connected routes, if you do uh, show IP route, they're listed with a C in the far left column. So uh, I've just given a brief example here. Oops, almost there. By default, routers only know about directly connected subnets. They're not going to know about anything else um, unless you tell them or unless you set up a routing protocol of some sort. So there's a quick example. Um, and on this router, you can see that I've configured three directly connected subnets, uh, 1011, 1012, and 1013. Um, and this is the sort of output you would see in a show IP route. The next sort of route that we're going to talk about are static routes. These are actually routes that are added by you to tell a router where to find an individual network. So these are nice um, as band-aids. Um, and the syntax is given right here. So uh, IP space route space and then the destination network, the destination subnet mask, and the next hop. And there's an optional parameter at the end. Um, for administrative distance, you can actually specify in a static route what the administrative distance is. This is very useful um, if you want a static route to take over when a routing protocol fails, for example, or if you want a static route to take precedence over a routing protocol. So static routes are basically designed to be temporary things. You should not use these in actual network deployments. They're, as I mentioned, band-aids, uh, because static routes only provide one-way connectivity. If I want to statically route from uh, router A to router B, uh, my traffic will get to router B, but if traffic wants to go back, uh, reply traffic, the route, I will also have to install a static route on router B uh, saying where the uh, source network was located. So um, every single static route you have to have to and from uh, static routes and, uh, and obviously on bigger networks this gets very, very uh, not unscalable. Um, administrative distance, as I mentioned, can be manually set. Uh, this is useful for interaction with other protocols. The default administrative distance for a static route is run, and I don't think I mentioned it, uh, but the default administrative distance for a directly connected route is zero. And uh, again, sort of like uh, the spanning tree, the lowest administrative distance is going to be the best. Same thing with metric. You want the lowest metric or the lowest cost to get wherever it is you need to go, and so lower is better. Um, on a point-to-point -point connections, you can actually specify instead of a next hop being an IP address, you can actually specify it as an interface because typically, well not typically, it's a point-to-point -point connection, right? There are only two endpoints on the connection. There are only two IP addresses on the connection. And so rather than having to worry about pointing it at the IP address configured on the other end, you can simply say forward the traffic across that link to whatever host happens to be on the other side. So here's an example of uh, some static routes. You can see them there at the end. I've added two static routes, one to 10.1.4 and another one to 10.1.5. And uh, the first one, you can say I've pointed it at a particular host. And in the second one, I pointed it out a serial interface. Uh, this is likely on a point-to-point -point connection. Um, and so you'll notice that in parentheses there, or in square brackets next to the uh, network, we list uh, 1 slash 0. The first number is the administrative distance, that's the 1. And the second number is the metric for that particular routing protocol. Since these are static routes, the metric is always going to be 0. And then, uh, so I challenge you on your own time, I want you to look at the static routes in this routing table, go back and look at the previous slide, and write out the static route statement that I typed in to create these static routes in the routing table. There's a type of static route that's particularly interesting and very, very uh, uh, useful in most cases, especially where you have devices that are typically connected to the internet. So um, in lots of situations you'll have a router that's connected to the internet and uh, you'll want to specify that all traffic for all unknown subnets goes to the ISP to be routed out. Um, and so what a route, uh, such a router will need to forward that traffic to an edge router, a service provider edge router, and to do this we add a default route that covers all subnets this can actually be done in a couple of different ways, uh, but it's also, uh, just keep in mind, this is going to be the least specific route in your routing table. We're not going to specify a subnet mask, we're going to specify 0.0.0.0, .0, .0 and uh, for subnet mask, also all zeros, um, so it's going to be as the least specific route. As there, if there is a more specific route in the routing table, it will take that, otherwise it will take the default route and route it out to whatever your next hop you specify. So the syntax for this, finally, 
his IP route, and as I mentioned, the address is going to be all zeros, and the subnet mask is going to be all zeros, and then you would specify the next help. Typically, this would be the IP address of the service provider router connected to your router. Um, there's also another way to specify the IP route, uh, default route, and that is IP default network. And default network is actually more useful if you want to forward traffic out a network uh, that's learned by a routing protocol, and we'll talk more about that when we get to it. Uh, the second command, as I mentioned, is useful uh, if you want to install uh, have a default route be installed with a routing protocol because there are a number of different ways to get to uh, sometimes particular networks. And so rather than specifying a next hop that's tied to a sing single particular host, you may just want to specify that a network is upstream. Go ahead and pass the traffic that way. So now we're going to look at some different types of routing. Um, there are actually two main types that we're concerned with. One is classless routing. Um, and with classless routing, only the subnet mask is considered when routing traffic. Um, now, the other type, as you might be guessing, is classful routing. Um, and so what classful routing protocols and classful routers assume is that if you know about the major network, then traffic to all possible subnets within that network should be routed to you as well. That is to say, um, for example, if a classful router learns uh, that 10.1.1.0 slash 24 is located at a particular uh, router, say router B, then it will forward all traffic for the entire 10.0.0.0 slash 8 network to that router. It assumes that because that router has access to one subnet in the 10 network, it should have access to all subnets in the 10 network. It assumes that uh, all of your networks, uh, all of your classful networks are going to be contiguous. Um, and this actually can cause problems. Um, routing is usually classless by default, um, and it's tip you can make it classful with the command no IP classless. So here's an example um, of a routing uh, table that has been installed. Um, so you can see I've got 10.1.1.0 there and 11.1.1.0 there. Uh, these are the only there are only two routes. One of them is a directly connected route. One of them is a static route. Um, from a classful perspective, uh, it 10. It assumes that 10.1.1.2, that's the next hop to get to 11, also knows about all of the other 11 networks, um, and the classless uh, does not. So for a variable length subnet mask, now we're going to talk about using multiple lengths of subnet mask. In the previous examples, uh, we've all gone with uh, consistent subnet masks. In other words, when we've looked at subnets, they've all been the same size. Um, what we can do, if we want to, to conserve addresses, we can actually uh, change the subnet mask length depending on uh, what the requirements are. So we may have one network with uh, 250 hosts. We may have another network with only 100 hosts. We can actually use different subnet masks for those two different networks, as long as there is no overlap in those two networks. And there are different ways to calculate this. Um, so uh, VLSM is a classless thing because remember we had issues when we were looking at uh, uh, classful routing protocols assuming things about classful boundaries and with VLSM uh, there are no classful boundaries you can't worry about that sort of thing and so VLSM will work with will not work with classful routing protocols. protocols it will only work with classless routing protocols and we'll distinguish between classful versus classless routing protocols as we cover those VLSM saves addresses, um, and the idea here is that you know give we can keep everything on the same on the same network. But for example, for a point-to-point -point link, you don't need an entire 100 address space for that. You only need two addresses, and so it makes more sense to use a smaller slash 30 subnet mask, which provides for two hosts, rather than an entire you know slash 24 subnet mask, for example, which is for 254 hosts. Um, so here we have an example of VLSM. You'll notice that all of the addresses on this page begin with 172.16. However, the difference is in how they end. Um, so we have 172.16.1.0. I'm starting over on the right side of the page. Uh, the router is connected to .1.0 and .2.0, which are two slash 24 subnets. And then you'll see that there are several different point-to-point -point links configured on 14.132, 14.136, 14.140, um, and then we have several networks behind those routers um, that are slash 27 subnets, and so we have all of these different length subnet masks depending on the requirements of each network 
and um, this tends to work really really well if you want to keep all of your addresses in the same contiguous space it makes routing a little bit easier um, it's a bit of a challenge and again classical routing protocols do not work with this sort of uh, thing so um, VLSM design questions are probably the hardest problems you're going to encounter because you have to look at each network and determine the starting and ending address to make sure that there are no overlaps. Um, so what you'll need to do is you should determine how many hosts need to be on each network. And be sure when you're doing that that you include router interfaces in your host calculations. This is something that people very often forget. You cannot specify um, a host uh, you basically can't specify a number of hosts. You also have to include the router in your number of hosts uh, because the router takes up one IP address. It takes up a host IP. It's considered basically a host on that subnet. So don't forget about that. So basically just don't forget to add one. Um, and try to, what I usually suggest to do is that I suggest you allocate the largest blocks of addresses first and make sure that you don't overlap. Make sure that uh, you move on past the end of useful address ranges. Um, it's not necessarily strictly followed. You can do it a different way. There are lots of different ways to do this. Um, as long as you're careful and make sure that they don't overlap, uh, there are a number of solutions to almost any given VLSM question. That just about covers it for uh, this presentation on writing protocols. Uh, again, if you have questions, feel free to put them in the comments, and uh, I'll see you in the next presentation.